This evening, Luke chapter number eight, Luke chapter number eight, and I'm coming down here. <clears throat> the oldest preacher I ever knew was Dr. James Akers. He was 116 when I met him. He was a member of the Jordan Baptist Church in Lynchburg, Virginia, and uh, he had buried his first wife, and his second wife was about 80 some odd, and she was younger than his kids who were still alive. <laughs> And uh, Dr. Akers, our, our youngest boy, was about three, and he put his hand down, rubbed his head like, you know, men will do a little boy. Turned to my wife and said, this young man's going to do great things for God. And he's now pastoring a, a really great church in Florida. He's our pastor. Hey. Then he looked at me and turned back to my wife and said, this man's going to die in the pulpit. So I preach down here as often as I can. I <laughs> I don't know how accurate he was, but why take a chance? Look, I'm prepared to go, but I'm not ready. I made all the preparations, but I'm not ready, amen. I want to, I want to preach to y'all. I've wanted to preach to y'all since I quit this morning. I, I got excited about it, amen, that's true. Preacher took us out to lunch, it was delicious. McDonald's tastes the same no matter where you go. It's, <laughs> We didn't go there. Burger King. No, 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 no. A me nice Mexican place. It's good food, wasn't it? I'll tell you what, I, I enjoyed that. I, I'm, you know, people that can laugh can get revived. If you can't laugh, laughter does good like a medicine. That's some folk I know needs massive doses. <laughs> Luke chapter number 8, look down at verse number 41, Luke 8, 41. The Bible said, and behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house, for he had one only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she lay a-dying. But as he went, the people thronged him. And a woman having an issue of blood 12 years had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the board of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood staunched. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude thronged thee and pressed thee, and sayest thou who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody had touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. When the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him, how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. And while he had spake, there cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Thy daughter is dead. Trouble not the master. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. When he came in the house, he suffered no man to go in, save Peter and James and John, the father and mother of the maiden. And all wept and bewailed her, but he said, Weep not, she is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. He put them all out and took her by the hand and called, saying, Maid, arise. And her spirit came again, and she arose straightway, and he commanded to give her a tofu, and bean sprouts and sushi and decaffeinated coffee. No, he said, give her meat. Another reason to love Jesus. As if we didn't have enough already. Give her meat. And her parents were astonished. But he charged her that they should tell no man what was done. We'll find our text at the last sentence in verse 42. I'd like for you to say this with me. We're going to say it twice, not get in a hurry, but help me say this. But as he went, the people thronged him. Once again, but as he went, the people thronged him. And I want to preach on this thought tonight. What do you do when you're stuck in traffic? We came from Louisiana, and we came through Atlanta. Oh. And we got stuck in traffic. Imagine that. 
Jairus has got one little girl, 12 years of age. She lays a dying. How sick is she? She dies. That's the next step after being sick. If you don't get well, you die. He's done the right thing. He came to Jesus. Doesn't say it in Luke, but in one of the companion gospels, it said that Jesus got up to go with him. But as they went, the people thronged him. Now Jairus cannot go forward or backwards. He cannot go to the right or to the left. He's stuck not where he wants to be. There's some folk here tonight that's stuck, but it's not where you want to be. You can see the physical healing that you'd like to have just ahead, but right now you can't get there. You can see the financial place you'd like to be in. It's right up there, but right now you can't get there. Maybe it's a family problem you'd like to see solved, but you can't get there right now. What do you do when you're stuck in traffic? Father, I pray that you'd help us tonight. Lord, that you'd deal with our hearts. Lord, we desperately need you. Jairus has done the right thing. He's come to you. Lord, may we come to you and depend on you and wait on you for what you're going to do in our lives. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. Three things that you want to do when you're stuck in traffic. This is just the introduction because y'all look scary to me tonight. I'm trying to get warmed up a little bit. <laughs> Sometimes you want to make a U-turn. Uh -huh. Now that's illegal to do on the interstate. You bunch of rednecks, you got to quit doing that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Now you didn't want to be back there, so you left there to go somewhere else. And now you're going to turn around and go back to where you didn't want to be in the first place? Yeah. Some people have gotten saved and turned back to the old life. Right. Some people started out for God. Yes, sir. They started out with Jesus to go somewhere, but something happened in their life, and they got stuck in a place they didn't want to be, and instead of waiting for God to clear things out, they made a U-turn and went back to where they wasn't supposed to be. Sometimes you want to make a U-turn. Sometimes you want to take a shortcut. Shortcuts, in my opinion, aren't. Right. That, that gets you in a mess. Yes, sure. Well, well, you know, God's pretty old. We probably got to help him out. He don't need help. Sure. This tithing thing's moving pretty slow, preacher. I'm going to take my tithe and invest it in lottery tickets and kind of move things along. No, you're trying to take a shortcut. Sure. That's right. Sometimes want to make a U-turn. Sometimes want to take a shortcut. Sometimes you take the wrong exit. Yeah. Now you don't know what's off that exit, Sure. but you, you're tired of being where you are, so you're going to do something even if it's wrong. We had this big coach, that I, I told you this morning, it, the truck and trailer is about 70 foot. I've never put a tape on it because when the police pull me over, I want to have plausible deniability. <laughs> or I don't know how long it is. But I have four GPSs in that coach. One's in the dash, it's the original equipment. It has the height and width and length and weight of the coach pre-programmed into it so it won't take me under a bridge that's too low or one that can't bear the weight. The second one is a aftermarket GPS. It's on the dash. It has some features this one doesn't have. Then I have one in my telephone that helps me find fuel and rest areas and things like that. And the fourth one is my wife. So I have four women at one time telling me how to drive. Now I'll tell you something. I have got off on the wrong exit with the coach, and the GPS is telling me the ones to take and how to go, but I have made mistakes and got off the wrong exit, and the sign comes up and says, Truck Accessibility Unknown. We don't know what's on this road, and you're on your own. You take the wrong exit away from God. Sure. That's right. You can get yourself in a mess. Because you don't know what's off that exit. Right. right. Let's find out about this man named J. Iris just for a little while this evening. It's, uh, I can't read that clock, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> Number one, I want you to see the humility of the Pharisee.
The humility of the Pharisee. Back in verse 41, and keep your Bibles handy. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house, where he had one only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she lay a dying. But as he went, the people thronged him. Now, to get to be a ruler of the synagogue, you couldn't just sit around all day rubbing your phone. I know they didn't have that, but they had the equivalent of wasting time like we do. He's a ruler of the synagogue. He's got a 12-year-old child, so he's probably not very old. He's reached this place, this, this place of prestige, if you will. If it hadn't been important, the Bible wouldn't have put it in there. He's a ruler of the synagogue. Sure, right. To be a ruler of the synagogue, he most likely had to be a member of the Sanhedrin Council. To be a member of the Sanhedrin, you had to have the Pentateuch memorized. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, memorized. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's about as far as I've got. Anybody here want to step up and up, you know the rest of them? No, I didn't think so. He had something on the ball. But now he's come to something in his life that that doesn't impress. Sure. And that is called death. Death is not impressed by your position in life. Right. Death is not impressed by your financial situation. The richest men that have ever lived have died. Five billionaires went to meet their maker in a little submarine. If money could buy your way out of debt, Elvis Presley would have bought his way out of debt. Other rich man, are you listening to me? Death is not impressed by your money. Death is not impressed by your baptismal certificate, your tithing record, your church membership. Death is, he's come on something he cannot fix, he cannot handle, he cannot abide, he can't do anything about it. It's brought him to a place of humility. He falls at the feet of Jesus. With this prestige comes this position. With this position, I'm no doubt, comes a little bit of pride. But now he's come on something he can't do anything about. And I don't know where you are in your life, but if you haven't already, you're going to come on something that you need Jesus for. And your intellect can't fix it, and your family can't fix it, and nothing can repair the humility of the Pharisee. So we see the humility of the Pharisee. Number two, we see the horror of the parents. The horror of the parents. Now, they've got this little girl. She's 12 years old, the only child that they have, and she is no doubt dying. In fact, she does die. The horror of the parents, the unspeakable tears. Told you a little bit about our son passing away this morning. And uh, again, he died in Port Orange, Florida. Was in a revival there. Got his body taken care of and flown back to Texas. And then we drove back in our bus, the, no doubt the longest trip we ever made. And I cried and I wept and Jeannie sat up there beside me. And I cried and she cried and we cried and we thought about memories. She went through her Bible and, and marked every place And she read them again to me how that God had healed somebody in the Bible. And she had written out in in the margin, please heal my Brian. And God did. Wasn't the way we wanted it done. But he is perfect today. And we cried and we wept for over a thousand miles. Our church at home at that time was the Bethel Baptist Church. We're going back there on Thursday. That's where our trailer and truck uh, bu- uh, car is at the Bethel Baptist Church. They have, a, they have a small mission house behind that church. It's still there. And the, most of the pa- parking for the, the church is behind the church. That's just where it is. We got in about 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning. I don't remember. It's li- very late. When the bus went around the church and the headlights picked up 30 or 40 cars, in the parking lot and people standing out there beside their cars waiting for us to come home and the tears came again. I'm talking about the unspeakable tears. You you don't know what weeping is until there's been a loved one that's gone to the other side. 
unspeakable tears, the unstoppable tragedy. She's died. He's stuck in traffic. The, the, the people have thronged around the Lord, and thus around uh, Jairus. And it's, though, though he's with the Lord, and though they're going the way he wants them to go, right now they can't do anything about it, and his little girl's still dying. You see, just because you get Jesus and start that way, that don't stop the tragedy. The unspeakable tears, the, un, the unstoppable tragedy, and the unbelievable torment of this little two-letter word, if. If we had done this, if we had gone there, if we would prayed more, if we would fasted. I want to tell you something, friend, you cannot live in ifville. You can't live there. Most of that is in the rear view mirror. Yeah. And living where it's if keeps you from living in the present and the future. And so you cannot live there. You've got to realize where you are and go on. The humility of the Pharisee, the horror of the parents. Number two, number three, the hindrance to the progress. Well, there's some hindrance. Uh, as they go, <laughs> the crowd gathers around them. Amen. Now, I want to tell you something. I can't, bl I can't blame the crowd. They probably don't know about the little girl and being sick. They just want to be where Jesus is. He's here because he said, where two or three are gathered together, I'm there. But if he physically walked through those doors back there, I'd probably run over some of you. Oh, I'd want to be where he was. Sure. I'd want to bask in his presence. Are you listening to me? The hindrance to the progress, the unanswered prayers, the unfulfilled peace, unfulfilled peace, and the unchanged problem. Now, have you under, ever wondered why sometimes God answers other people's prayers before He answers yours? I don't know, I'm asking you, because I don't know. When I was about five or six years old, maybe seven, I don't remember, doesn't matter, a word came into my vocabulary that I grew to hate, I despised it. The word was because. I hated that word. Dad, can we stop after church and get an ice cream? No. Well, how come? Because. <laughs> and with my dad, that stopped the conversation. I found out the word because means I'm dad and you're not. <laughs> and I know why we're not stopping, but I'm not obligated to tell you. Right. And I hated that word until I got grown and got kids, and it became my go-to word. <laughs> but sometimes I think God looks at us and says, it's just because. Yeah. Why, why did God answer your prayer before he answered mine? I don't know. He's God, but he's not obligated to tell us. We had a house up in Indiana, and we, I don't know how long we had it, too long, and we put it up for sale, went through three Realtors, they showed it one time. Three of them showed it one time. And uh, uh, we, we hated that house. Yes. One year we spent four nights in it. Not in a row. Just one night, three or four months later, another night. And you had to decide whether you're going to mow the grass or bale it. <laughs> it was no fun to go. It was work to go to that house. And we put it up for sale and for three years tried to sell that thing. And somebody said, Brother Harold, uh, what can I pray with you about? I said, we need rice. <laughs> and I want to sell that house. And while I was selling it, somebody comes and said, it happened so many times. Hey, man, my neighbor, my friend had a house put up for sale while he was driving the for sale sign down in the yard. A guy pulled up and offered him 10000 more than what he was asking. I said, do you hate me? <laughs> Why you won't tell me stuff like that? <laughs> you know, sometimes God answers somebody else's prayer or he answers yours. Yeah. Why? Because I don't know. One of these days we might find out, but I think when we get to heaven it won't matter. The humility of the Pharisee, the whore of the parents, the hindrance to the progress, the hymn of the physician. Well, there's a little break in the action. They're all packed together. And if probably they hadn't been packed together in this traffic jam, this little lady wouldn't have got to catch up with them. But she's got an issue of blood, and she's had it for 12 years. 
The Bible said that she has spent all that she had on physicians and not gotten better. Or she is physically depleted. She's bled for 12 years. As far as we know, no iron pills, no vitamins. As far as we know, to build up that loss of blood in this lady's life. She's physically depleted. She's spiritually depleted. She couldn't go to the house of God. Bleeding out, bleeding out of her normal time. Sure. So for 12 years she hasn't been able to go to the temple. Physically depleted, spiritually depleted, financially depleted. She spent all the money she had. But she said, if I could touch the border of his garment, the only thing I know is the hem. I just touch. And this crowd's gathered around them. They're thronging him. And I guess the only way she could get to that hem, that border, that bottom, was to have crawled through that crowd, past men's knees and, and, and elbows and men's feet. Do you, do you know anything about men's feet? They got those frito corn chip looking toenails going on down there. <laughs> Remember that next time you're having frito pie, amen. <laughs> She doesn't care about any of that. She's not looking at any of that. She is focused on getting to where Jesus is. And she reaches out by faith and touches the hem or the border. And immediately her issue of blood staunch, the Bible tells us. This is true faith. True faith. Do we, do we know what faith is? Well, we got a, we've got some descriptions of it. But I, 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 I have enough faith to gotten saved. But I've never plucked up a tree and planted it in the ocean. Could you put your hand up if you've done that? I want to. See? We've got faith to get saved, but I wonder how much faith we have. Sure. True faith. A fellow told me one time, Brother Harold, if you've got true faith, it will cast out fear. That's not true. Because not only did she have true faith, she had tormented fear. When Jesus said, who touched me, she's afraid to say anything about it. Yeah. Fear is there. You can have faith and still be afraid. Yeah. We're working on our second million miles with Delta alone, flying. And we get on the plane, you, you put your faith in God that he can get that plane over there. Then the pilot walks by. And we look at each other and say, shouldn't he be in, a, in the junior high? And the older I get, the younger they look. <laughs> huh? Now, what is an airplane? It's 100,000 parts built by the lowest bidder. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> So I've got faith in God, but I'm still a little bit afraid on that thing, amen. <laughs> By the way, we've been on planes that had a little trouble, never any major trouble, thank God for that, but things just jump up and down, go sideways, you know, in turbulence. I have never heard anybody say, oh, Buddha, <laughs> oh, Mohammed. Nobody's ever said that, but I have heard them say, oh, God, because they know who's in control. Down deep in their subconscious, they know who's in control. That, that was not even part of that thing. True faith, tormented fear, but total fulfillment. She is healed immediately. Notice number whatever this is, the hateful proclamation. Look back in your Bible. While he, verse 49, while he had spake, there come one the ruler of the synagogue's house saying to him, thy daughter is dead, trouble not the master. You say, why do you call this a hateful proclamation? Because whoever this was that elbowed their self through the crowd mm -hmm. could have said to Jairus, sir, I don't know how to tell you this, but she didn't make it. Your little girl's passed. I'm really sorry to be the bearer of badness, but that's not what he says. Thy daughter is dead. Trouble not the master. You know, he's really blaming the dad. You're the dad. You should have done something about this. You should have handled this. You should have taken care of this. I'll tell you something, the devil does that. He did it to me after my boy died. And I lived in Ifville for a while if we'd done that, if we'd gone here. 
I'm going to tell you something. Don't let the devil take control of your thoughts. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. See, the father's daughter and the finality of death and the failure of the divine trouble not the master. What he's saying is, Jairus, you failed the girl, and there's nothing Jesus can do about it either. Don't even trouble him. Death is done, and it's over, and even Jesus can't do anything about it. But I'll tell you something, it ain't over till he says it's over. And he's going to get the last laugh, if you will. The hateful proclamation. Notice the healing presence. There's a simple command. Verse 15, when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Fear not, believe only, she shall be made whole. When he came in the house, he suffered no man to go in, say Peter and James and John, the father and mother of the maiden, and all wept and bewailed her. But he said, Weep not, she is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed in the scorn, knowing that she was dead. You understand, these are paid mourners. These are people that are paid, probably women, to come and mourn and cry and weep and wail and complain. So they might have been Democrats. <laughs> I, I didn't say they were. I said they might have been. And go away and say I said that. A simple command, weep not. Weep not. Weeping is a part of the human makeup. Weeping is it's God's way, I believe, of, of helping to cleanse the heartache that goes on in our hearts. And it endures for a night and joy comes in the morning. But Jesus wept. We got several illustrations in the scripture about weeping. And weeping, is, it will help you. But he says to her, weep not. Now, has, that, has anybody ever told you don't cry when your heart was completely broken inside and they don't know what they're talking about? But he does. A simple command, weep not. A statement that's calming, she's not dead but sleepeth. See, to Jesus, that's what it was. He finally told the disciples, Lazarus is dead. They, he said, he, he's sleeping. Well, if he sleeps, he does well. And finally, he said, I'm not getting through to you guys. He's dead. He's not DOA. He's DRT, dead right there. <laughs> Not dead on arrival, dead right there. He dead. But to Jesus, it's just sleeping. That's right. That's right. Did you love the verse in the Bible? Oh, it's said so many times at the funerals. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of a saint. Now, what does that mean? Here's what here's what it means to me. You have a lady that's expecting a baby. Eight, nine, what, nine? Been a long time. Nine months pregnant. And she comes on Wednesday night, and she's great with child. They got to they gotta go to the bathroom every seven minutes. It's all right. It's, that's the way God made it to happen. They get up real slow and they sit down real slow. And the place of the women gather, I thought you'd have had that baby. We saw you Sunday night. I thought you'd have had that baby. When's the baby due? I can't wait for the baby to get here. I can't wait. Well, the baby's here. Just not here. What we want to do is get our hands on the baby. Want to hold the baby. And women say stuff like, well, he's got his mother's eyes. Just looks like eyes to me. I don't know. <laughs> women see stuff or want to see stuff. Yeah. It's the big glob of kid there, you know. <laughs> Puking, pooping kid. That's what he is. I'm telling the truth. But we want to get our hands on the baby. And God is in heaven tonight saying, I can't wait for Harold to die. Because then I get my arms on him. Then I can hold him. Just as we look forward to the birth of a baby, he looks forward to the death of his saint then he can hold us and love us. Oh, my goodness. The, the statement that's calming, the scorn that's crushed, they laughed in the scorn. He's going to crush it. How did he do that? By raising her from the dead. Then what you going to say? Go ahead and laugh now. They laughed in the scorn. You ain't laughing now, are you? She's up. Give her a hamburger. 
If we'd have gone past Acts, he could have said, give her bacon, because thank God Peter went up on the rooftop. I'm thankful every day that Peter went up on the roof. I can have bacon, and we have that Gentile thing about that. You know, that's good, too. But I mean the bacon. Amen, bro. That's right. So he gets her up. Now, that's the introduction. Let me give you the message. I got three things I want you to remember when you're stuck in traffic. Number one, it won't take long. He has mercy. He cares about your heartache. And there may nobody, even your family, know where you're stuck in your life. Maybe the preacher don't know. Maybe my mom and dad don't know. Maybe the husband, maybe the wife. Maybe nobody knows. You've kept it bottled up. You want to get there, but you can't get there. I want to tell you something. He has mercy. We drove from Louisiana to here uh, yesterday. I used his mercy awful hard. <laughs> used it hard. When I got up this morning, he had it new. It's new every morning. Amen. Just what, is, what do you do with mercy? Burn it up. Yes, sir. Wear it out. Amen. Work it hard. Because yes, in the morning, there's a new batch. Amen. And his grace. Amen. He handed me his grace. I said, oh, thank you, Lord. And by the time I take it in my hand, he said, wait a minute, I've got a new batch here for you. I said, well, okay. Let me, and, and then I said, what am I going to do? And he said, wait a minute. Just something just come off hot stove. And it's new grace. Amen. Amen. Oh, you can't run out. You can't use it up. Amen. He has mercy. Number two, wasn't that fast? <laughs> he can do miracles. Amen. That's right. He raised this little girl from the dead. Yes, sir. That's right. And by the way, he still does miracles. Amen. I have experienced, I've experienced entertaining angels that I didn't know about until it was after. We used to, before we got our coach for 19 years, we was in a truck pulling a trailer and we pulled into Texarkana, no, no, Arkadelphia, Arkansas, and just to get a break and pull in, and the, and flames burst out behind the truck. I stopped it. Jeannie jumped out of her side. I jumped out of my side. They were coming down there where the driver's left foot would be. Didn't have a fire extinguisher. Jeannie threw me a bottle of water. Pulled that thing back, squirted it on her. Didn't do a thing. It's hard for a man my size to get under the steering wheel and in front of that seat by the door coming out here. Hard to do. I'm down there and I, I said, the water didn't do anything. I got to do something. And I get my way out from under there and there stands a man with a fire extinguisher. Use this, he says. I grabbed it out of his hand, got back under that steering wheel in front of that seat, and squirted that fire, and boy, it went out, and I sprayed it again, and then I pulled that thing back and sprayed it real good, handed it back to him, he took it, I pulled that thing back, and the fire was gone out. When I stood up, he was gone. I believe God sent an angel. You'll never convince me he didn't send an angel to keep my foot truck from burning down. I've experienced miracles. We went to Romania several years ago. We took some women with us, five, and Jeannie, and one man. Don't ever do it, men. <laughs> and we went over there and we did Christmas for uh, three orphans' homes and the three gypsy churches. And I came back, I came to America and come to church like this and raise money for all you rich Americans. And compared to them, we are. And we went over there, and I didn't take men because men are terrible shoppers. Amen. And women are great shoppers. And men are terrible rappers. And women are great rappers. I tried rapping. I'm terrible. What are you hiding about? You know, tying a knot in the top of the Walmart sack kind of looks like a bow to me. I mean, it's what I'm saying. I took these women over there, and we shopped, and we bought every toy in every store we came to, and then they, they wrapped them. We had parties at the orphans' homes. We had the best time and made hot chocolate and sang Christmas carols. Got most of those kids out of the garbage dump. They never had one thing in their life. And God let us do, it was him, he let us do great things with them. Went to gypsy churches, had great, took them food, and we had a great time. And on the way back, you got, it's a two hour, four hour car trip from Arati, Romania to Budapest, Hungary to get to the plane. 
You got to cross the Romanian border into Hungary, and that's a story in itself. I'll tell you about that sometime. And we got to Budapest. The airport was going on strike that day, going on strike. Had two terminals. We got the first terminal, put all the big luggage in there. We had to physically run to the second terminal, put all your T's in your, of course, you can't care park pocket knife, but belt shoes, you know how it is, that one, and, and then a briefcase and everything, and then get it and run back up the other one and got on a plane. And so I've got, I've got five women. It's like herding cats. <laughs> I mean, I'm trying to get them on the plane. I want to get them back to the States. They're standing in front of windows saying, I wonder if that comes in my size. I believe I have some shoes at home that would make, get on the plane. <laughs> Got them all on the plane. First stop, Amsterdam. Get ready to get off in Amsterdam. I reach up and get my briefcase, and it's too light. It don't feel right. I pull it down, and the laptop's not in it. I said, Jeannie, have you got the laptop? No, it was in your briefcase. I said, I know. She said, where is it? I said, it's at the checkpoint. She said, they're going on strike. I said, no, I know. It's in a foreign country, the airport's, it's gone. She, I said, what's on it? She said, everything for Harold and Jeannie Noble Ministries and everything for the Brian Noble Children's Foundation, everything's on that computer. We get back to the States, get each lady back on the plane going to her respective city. Two or three months later, we're at the Trinity Baptist Church in Saginaw, Texas, church we've been to many times. And uh, we had a Sunday night off, wasn't preaching, so we went to church there. And Brother uh, Greg Jones was opening the door, a deacon and a good friend. And so we came in, we talked a little bit, of, you know, we'd taken them to Philippines one time. And uh, uh, Jeannie started into the sanctuary. I started to follow her. He said, hey, Brother Harold, be sure you lock your vehicle because we've had some mischief out here. And, and Carol, that's his wife, Carol lost a laptop out of her car. I said, well, I don't have to worry about that because mine's at the airport in Budapest, Hungary. And a woman walking by that I did not know said, I can get that for you if you'd like for me to. And I said, well, of course you can. <laughs> See, I just found out that sarcasm's not one of the fruits of the Spirit. I thought that was, I thought that's my deal right there. Amen. I don't have the other one, but I got that. But it's not even part of it. <laughs> She said, yes, I can get that. She said, you got an address, phone number. I hand her this card, one of these cards right here. And uh, I said, the phone number's on the back. And she disappeared in the sanctuary. I turned to Brother Greg and said, who is that woman? He said, I'm a deacon. I don't know who she is. I've never seen her in my life. Two months later, I get a call from the embassy in Budapest, the American embassy. Mr. Noble, can you describe the laptop? I said, I sure can. It's a silver Toshiba. You open it up, if it's got any battery life on it, you pull up, it'll have a screensaver that'll have my granddaughter on the screen. And if you open up the tray, it'll have an Andy Griffith DVD. <laughs> what I'm talking about in the tray, amen. And it will be the only laptop in the country of Hungary with my granddaughter and Andy. And two weeks later, that thing came by special courier to my door, intact, nothing missing. Don't tell me he don't do miracles. He has mercy, does miracles, one more. He can multitask. Now, most men can't do this. Women, get the young'uns out of the tub, get them in the pajamas, get them to the table, get the chicken fried, the tater smashed, the gravy made without any lumps, get the tea in the glass without it melting all the ice, call you to supper, get it all done at the same time. Men do not have this ability. It is vacant from our genes. It is not in the DNA. I can do two things at one time. I can eat nachos and watch football. But he's not me. Yeah. And all the time he's answering your prayer, he hadn't forgot about yours. And when he gets around to yours, he's still thinking about yours. Just because he answers somebody's ahead of you, don't mean he hadn't been thinking about you. Yes, he healed the little lady, then he raised the dead. So he may not have got to you yet. But don't take a shortcut. Yes, sir. And don't make a U-turn. And don't take the wrong exit. 
You stay with Jesus till the traffic breaks up. And then you're ready to go with him. We get in traffic jams quite often out on the highway. Quit honking. <laughs> it didn't do it any good. If they could move, they would move. If it's bad, put it up and park. Do your email. If it's a long one, look out and see maybe a place to put a garden. <laughs> I don't watch the vehicle in front of me. I watch as far down the line as I can see. And I watch the big tractors. When those stacks pop open, that little puff of black smoke comes out, I know we're fixing, business is going to pick up. <laughs> we're fixing to go, amen. You say what I do, just stay with the Lord. Amen. Don't honk at people. I call it horn cussing. <laughs> oh, I felt conviction fall. <laughs> you stay with Jesus, he'll get you where he wants you to go. It may not be where you want to go, but he'll get you where he wants you to go. And where he wants you to go is a much better place than where you want to go. Heads are about and eyes are closed for just a few moments or so.